Good afternoon and welcome back to the Montgomery Summit. I'm Jamie Montgomery. Today we have a really fantastic session planned ahead for you with Dr. Ron Sugar moderating a conversation with John Chambers, Pradeep Kolsa, and General Stan McChrystal called Leadership During a Crisis. Now, John, I'll first say a few words about many of you know him as a longtime executive chairman and CEO of Cisco for over 20 years. And during the, those years, he grew Cisco from a $70 million company to over 47 billion in revenue. At one point, the world's largest company in terms of market cap. He acquired over 180 companies at Cisco and survived several business cycles. After stepping down from Cisco as, the, as executive chairman in December, 2017, he launched JC2 Ventures and serves as a investor, mentor, and board member to a series of very successful uh, private growth companies. He's also chairman of the U.S. Indian Strategic Partnership Forum, working closely with President Modi, and as well as a global ambassador for French technology, an appointment from President Macron of France. Chancellor Kosa uh, from University of California, San Diego, my alma mater, is a distinguished academic leader and electrical and, engin and computer engineer. He's the eighth chancellor of the University of California, San Diego. I've known most of them. And he, where he came to us from Carnegie Mellon, where he was the Dean of Engineering. At UC San Diego, Chancellor Kosa initiated and led a strategic plan, which was a comprehensive, all-inclusive planning process to unify the campus, define UC San Diego's future. And as a result, is arguably the most dynamic, fastest growing, and destined to be the most important of the UC campuses. Pradeep was an elected member of the National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the Indian Academy of Engineering, an honorary fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, and a fellow of the American Association of Artificial Intelligence. None of those four organizations would accept my membership application, in case you're wondering. He is also the recipient of numerous awards for his leadership, teaching, and research. He's beloved on campus by faculty, staff, students, alumni, trustees, and all the volunteers. In 2012, he's named one of the 50 most influential Indian Americans by Silicon India. That was probably understated. General McChrystal. Well, Stan is a transformational leader with, with a remarkable record of achievement. He was called one of America's greatest warriors by Secretary of Defense Robert Gates. Retired four-star general, he is the former commander of U.S. and International Security Forces, ISAF, Afghanistan, and the former commander of the premier military counterterrorism force, Joint Special Operations Command, JSAW. He is best known for developing and implementing the current counterinsurgency strategies that are used were utilized in Afghanistan and Iraq for creating a comprehensive counterterrorism organization that revolutionized interagency operating and interagency operating culture and procedures. John McChrystal co-founded the McChrystal Group in January 2011, where he's currently a partner. McChrystal Group's mission is to deliver innovative leadership solutions to American businesses to help them transform and succeed in a challenging and dynamic environment. For those of us who work with Stan in that capacity are equally impressed by his great leadership skills and insights as we all were observing him in the, in the military role. And then fourth, I'd like to introduce our moderator today, Dr. Ron Sugar. Dr. Sugar, or Ron, is a recognized leader in industry, academia, and government. And we think of a perfect moderator for this discussion. He served as chairman and CEO of Northrop Grumman, which was a very challenging position before settling to a life of a company director, investor, and philanthropist. In this new life, he shares as chairman of Uber, the lead director at Chevron, board member of Apple and Amgen, as well as a number of other private companies and academic institutions. He is a rocket scientist by training and a global business leader, a mentor, and a coach by avocation. Ron, Stan, Pradeep, John, thank you for joining us today. With that, I'll turn it over to Ron lead this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie, and uh, welcome to all of you out there. Uh, the topic today is uh, leadership during a crisis. And uh, it's important to recognize that uh, almost any of us can lead when times are going well. Uh, what really differentiates uh, leaders in any aspect, in any walk of life is what happens when things don't go so well. We have three really remarkable folks uh, joining me here on the panel 
who have been through a whole series of very interesting experiences, which I think they're going to share with us. And they do represent a cross section of, of military life, academic life, and uh, business life. And, and some of these lines, as you will see, uh, over. Uh, what I'd like to do is to maybe uh, start off by asking each of them uh, for a thought or two on a particular crisis they have uh, met and, and how it went, then maybe move to some discussion about how they see us uh, coming out of uh, COVID, what's next. Uh, I think we'll open at that point in time to Q&A from the audience. I uh, very much encourage you to uh, put your questions in through the chat function. And then uh, finally, we'll wrap up with a very short lightning round with the three of them. So with that, uh, let, let me start off by uh, maybe starting with you, Stan. Uh, what was one of your most challenging crises? What did you do? What worked? What didn't work? What did you learn from it? Give me a couple of minutes on that to get us started. Sure, Ron. Thanks for asking. Uh, I'm going to take a particular angle. In the fall of 2003, I took command of America's Counter-Terrorist Forces, Joint Special Operations Command. And the biggest problem in that moment was in Iraq. The problem was, the problem was much different than it was viewed by most people. There was disorganized violence by former Saddam supporters. But inside of that, there was the growth of al-Qaeda in Iraq under Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. The problem was we had this growing crisis, but it wasn't recognized. So my challenge was to tell people that things were much worse than they seemed on the exterior and that we needed to start acting. That was inside my command, but also more broadly across the force. And in the military community, being chicken little and saying the sky's falling in is not a popular place to be because everybody takes a, a jaundiced eye at you. So my challenge was, and the way I went about it, was to start to gather data and put it in front of people and say, here, here are the indicators that this problem is far worse than we've admitted. And at the same time, rather than seeming like a panic artist, you've got to say, but we need a calm, focused approach to solving the problem. And so that's what I tried to do in that moment. I'd, I'd love to say I did it perfectly, but it's the kind of thing that you run into and you don't really expect to have to do. Thanks, Ron. That's great, great. Thanks, Dan, that's great. That's a good starter. Let's switch to academia now. Uh, I'm on the, the board of trustees of a couple of universities. I've worked with a number of fine university presidents, uh, certainly every bit the caliber of, of Pradeep, and, and he's certainly amongst the best of the best. I concluded after some time on those boards that I would be absolutely unqualified, incapable, and ineffective, even though I was a CEO of a major Fortune 100 company, of being able to run a real university. But uh, Pradeep, you probably have a, an interesting story or two to share with us of a crisis you faced. You know, so typically for any president or chancellor, the budget issue is a crisis. But let, let me tell you, this time around, I think without exception, this pandemic was a crisis. Uh, bar none for each and every one of us. And especially for me here at UC San Diego, here I was uh, in an environment where we are very deliberative and where we are very consultative. I had to make an overnight decision to send students home. I uh, had to make an overnight decision to convert us to uh, remote teaching. While I was doing it, I was looking at losses of 10 to $15 million a year because the dorms are gonna be empty about 40 plus million dollars a year because my hospital beds were gonna be empty. So here I was trying to protect about the uh, health of 30, 40,000 of my students at the same time losing about 50, $60 million a month, literally on a monthly basis. And I was so nervous, it was not even funny. Uh, and I had no idea how to manage it, to be honest with you. Uh, so I basically learned the crisis in real time as it was unfolding, I was learning just a day ahead as it was unfolding. I was managing it in real time. Uh, and I was managing it with a group of about 60, 70 people uh, for multiple reasons, completely non-intuitive to management gurus, completely non-intuitive to people in industry. But it worked like a charm because I had these people who had bought into the crisis, who had bought into our thinking or solutions, and they were my ambassadors, making sure that everybody was kept uh, abreast and uh, kept uh, within the constraints of what we were trying to do. So this was by far the most challenging thing. Very good, very good. Switching to uh, business, 
and technology. John, when John joined Cisco, it was a company of about 70 million or so in sales. By the time he hung up his spurs, uh, it was a company of nearly 50 billion in sales. And at uh, one time, of course, had the, uh, the record for being the largest market cap company. So you've been through a lot, John. You've been mostly up, but there's been a few ups and downs between the dot-com bubble, between the 2008 crisis. Share with us uh, a particular experience that you've had. Well, it, it is my sixth financial crisis, uh, my fifth healthcare crisis, although by far and away the most severe, and my third supply chain. So I've seen this movie so many times, and you can almost predict where the whys in the road are and what the outcome would be. Uh, lessons learned is the playbook doesn't change in terms of how you deal with crisis, how much was internally inflicted, how much was external, what's your game plan to uh, navigate through it. Uh, how do you communicate to the employees, to the media, to your customers, your investors? And then how do you position yourself as you come through the crisis to break away? In terms of 2001, from a business perspective for technology companies, it clearly was the 100-year flood. Uh, didn't see it coming. 70% growth uh, average going into it. And all of a sudden, in 45 days, we were minus 35% growth, and I'd never been below 50% positive growth ever. We were in free fall uh, on it. Uh, what was wrong and lesson learned is we continued to do the same thing for 40 quarters in a row, and my numbers did not show me the problem was coming. You learn each time and get a little bit better. 2008, uh, we saw the crisis almost nine months ahead of the market. Uh, we said there's something unusual going on in the finance industry. We saw their purchases slow down. Uh, we positioned our company to navigate through it, uh, and we did come out of it uh, in very good shape for our peers. And then in the last one, we actually saw it uh, in February of last year uh, due to some of my startups, Sunny seeing their business start to slow in Southeast Asia. We connected the dots and prepared all 18 startups that we were going to head into a downturn. And by April, when people would just begin to realize how serious the downturn was, we had already positioned all 18 to begin to move and position as they come out of it. Uh, key lessons learned, get your playbook, be realistic, transparent with the market, transparent with your customers and employees, and then lead by example. However, it will be lonely each time. I wish I could tell you it will not. It will be for the leaders. They stand and pretty clearly know. But that's great, John. John, maybe say a couple more words about the importance of communications as the leader as you're going through this period of uncertainty and everybody is just not sure what's coming next. Well, I, I think there is no time more important in effective communications than crisis. If you look as the leader, your job is just four things. Uh, strategy and vision for your organization, uh, whether you're a university, whether you're in the military, defense, or whether you're in the business, uh, develop, recruit, retain, and change the leadership team to implement the strategy. Uh, culture, which people underestimate dramatically how important it is to lead through crisis, and then communications. Ron, you know where I'm going with this. Uh, a leader in front of you and I, Jack Welch, uh, was probably the best business leader in the generation in front of us. But Jack was brilliant on strategy and vision, et cetera, but not a great communicator. Uh, the generation today has to be very effective on communications, mm -hmm. and the rules of thumb are so basic. You basically tell people how much was internal, inflicted, and external, like I talked about earlier. You've got to be transparent. People want to be honest. You get everything out on the table one time, whether you created it or is externally created or combination. And then you tell your key constituencies how you work through this. And then at the right time, you've got to say, here's what we could do when we come out. And you've got to know when do you put the gas pedal down to move from defense to offense. But communications is extremely important and uh, it has to be very rapid in terms of how you do it and consistent. That, that's great advice, John, thanks. Say, so, uh, Pradeep, uh, just to go back a little bit on the challenge that you faced, uh, San Diego, UC San Diego has been given national recognition uh, for the return to learn response to COVID. But I'm gonna guess that that wasn't quite as straightforward as it may have looked at the end, as you were getting lots of input, if not hate mail and all kinds of other kinds of forces. So, say a little bit about how did you deal with that as the leader? So two things, right? So first, I think I was fortunate enough that we have such a creative set of faculty that I was able to recognize 
innovations they were bringing to the fore that would help us safeguard this campus. So one of the best innovations was like wastewater testing, for example, which gives you a three to five day a window into an infection of like two. And we developed a test that could detect one positive in about two or 300 residents in a building. So that clearly was really important for us. Uh, the other innovation that helped us a lot was uh, trying to understand how do you influence behaviors of 18 to 25 year olds? Because everybody was afraid that these people were gonna come here and kill the community out here in La Jolla with their bad behavior. And we were able to do that. We had sociologists, psychologists, we had like the state of the art people telling us how to manage this. And the toughest challenge for me was at one point in this conversation, about 600 people, students, faculty, staff, wrote me a letter saying, you're making a mistake. You should not open the campus. And remember, I was trying to bring 10,000 students back to campus, the largest in the country, 10,000 to this campus. And it cost me two, three days of uh, loss of sleep. In the end, I thought about what I knew. I thought about what I did not know. I thought about what they knew versus what they did not know. And I made a bet that my judgment was right. I bet on my faculty, my staff, and I, I, I basically ignored their letter. And that was a very risky moment, but I'm glad I did because that allowed 10,000 students to come back to campus, enjoy a great uh, three quarters, uh, and really put us on the map in terms of return to learn. Well, that's that's a great story. And there's a uh, hundred other, maybe a, a thousand other examples around the country of campuses going through every other imaginable scenario than you can you can say. So you're right. right. But I have to say, Ron, that what John was saying, I think the, the real importance for me was being completely transparent and being completely inclusive in decision-making, excluding nobody. If somebody wanted to be on the team, I did not say no, because that would cause doubts. So my view was, come on, come on, come on, you know, let's all make a decision. And for everybody listening, Ron, it's important to understand, and, and Stan, I would bet you're exactly with me on this. Even though you do a great job of consensus and make everybody part of the decision, in the end, it's your call. Yes. It works. You get more credit you deserve. If it doesn't work, you'll be entirely held to blame. It is lonely. And as you're lonely, you get a hollow feeling in your stomach. You know you've got to make this call. You know the worst thing of all is not to make a decision. And yet you're not sure or sure that it will work. And you have to have the courage of your convictions and the courage trying to do the right thing. And it is lonely. So understand that when each of us hit our crisis in our personal lives or our business lives, it will be a period of loneliness. And I wish there was a better answer than that. <laughs> now, if I could jump on that, Ron, because I think John hit something really important. In the military, there's an old tradition of councils of war and leaders would get generals together, their subordinate commanders and poll them on what they thought they should do. And weaker commanders then hid behind that, that opinion. Good commanders were advised by it, took it on board, but then made the decision and owned it. And it, it's really important that everybody understands that's where you are. But the person who really needs to understand it is you. Mm -hmm. I, would just, I would just add that in, in my days when I was president, not yet CEO of Northrop Grumman, working with my, uh, my, my mentor and good friend, Kent Cressa, I, I, I thought I was a lot smarter than I did when I became the CEO and I had to actually <laughs> own the decision. I, it was just so obvious what he should do until I became him. And <laughs> yeah. holy cow. The, the other thing I would uh, tag on to what you said earlier, John, is that one of the greatest um, uh, mistakes in communication is assuming that it actually occurred. That is to say, you think you've told them you think you've told them, you think you've communicated, everybody's, you think they're all nodding, and then you make the decision and suddenly half the people somehow never got the memo or they were surprised or shocked and whatever. So, hey, uh, Stan, let me just go back to something you, you touched on earlier and, and clearly you were widely admired and respected uh, by your troops, uh, for your hands-on leadership, your willingness to say what other officers were thinking but were afraid to say, and then there's the question of truth telling. And one of the things I learned in my experience working very closely with the United States military through my career uh, has been the issue of speaking truth to power. And when you found yourself as, as a general officer in a chain of command 
in which you had absolute responsibility for these folks who are putting it on the line for the country, and you're reporting through to elected leadership, in some cases, sometimes military superiors, you find yourself kind of the meat in the sandwich. Say a little bit about your experiences in speaking truth to power when you have a responsible position. Sure, and because this is trickier than it sounds, on the one standpoint, if you've got an opinion, you sort of publicly throw it out there and it's almost confrontational to your superiors, and that's not the way to do it, in my view. In my view, if you've got something that's different from what they think or it's a hard truth, you need to find the right conduit, the right time, when you can communicate that clearly so that you don't get either immediate resistance from them or you don't look like you're using it as a lever to get something different. So that comes with maturity, but it also comes with important relationships between you and your boss. Both sides need to establish the kind of communication when you don't have a crisis where that kind of conversation can occur because it, when it gets really ugly, it's hard to the first time be frank and candid. Mm -hmm. well, that's, that's good advice. So, uh, Pradeep, uh, switching gears a little bit, uh, 2020 was a year unlike most others in our recent memory. And, and one of the dimensions, of course, was the civil unrest, mm -hmm. uh, which were triggered initially by the George Floyd situation and a series of others. Uh, what, how, how did you see all this? How did you deal with this uh, where you had uh, really in, in impassioned and activated students, and yet you still had to run a university? Uh, you were the establishment, but you had to be, you know, not sympathetic to the issues which are driving people's concern for change. Say a little about that being at the front lines here. You know, for the first time when I saw this, uh, clearly it was very unsettling for everybody, but it was clear to me that I did not understand everything I needed to understand as to how uh, my colleagues and my people were feeling. So I actually went on a little journey, it was a very fast journey to educate myself about the history of this country, about the issues in this country. I remember, I was not born in this country, so my history lessons were never K through 12 in the US. Uh, they were in India. So it was a very fast uh, education, which clearly I was on that journey, but this, was, this accelerated it. Uh, the second step for me was to be empathetic uh, with what was going on and really understand that these people were not making this up and there were some very significant issues. So we had, working with my vice chancellor for EDI, we developed this 21-day challenge called the Chancellor's 21-Day Anti-Racism Challenge, which was about bringing people together, creating forum for open exchange of ideas, for free and frank conversation, and trying to figure out what investments do we make, how do we deal with this problem systemically rather than create this committee and that committee, and then it goes away, and then 10 years later, the same thing happens again. Um, so it was a very challenging time. And let me tell you, a year later, six months later, we are still dealing with this problem. This problem has not gone away. Uh, this problem uh, is going to take multiple years to deal with. And I think universities have to be at the cutting edge, the forefront of dealing with this problem, acknowledging it, accepting it head on, and proposing solutions for the next generation of our students. That's great. You know, one, one best practice, which I think has emerged among some of the companies I work with and the CEOs and myself personally, is a number of my CEOs have reached out to find a reverse mentor. Uh, largely a person, a younger person, a person of color, a person right. of sexual orientation, uh, where they had an opportunity to actually spend a little time and say, look, I... I've had a different set of experiences. I'm seeing it through the lens of the CEO. I'm dealing with Wall Street. I'm dealing with investors. Tell me what your experience has been. Uh, wh where did you come from and your experiences? And, and uh, to, to an individual, the CEOs that have done this that, I, that I've worked with have found it extraordinarily uh, helpful to them in terms of improving their thought process of how to deal with this and then encouraging others in their organization create mentorship, other senior leaders in the organization to create reverse mentorship opportunities. And I can tell you, this goes a long way for, for the folks working in these companies to say, hey, they actually care and there's something I can do to offer to them. Look, this is well said, Ron, and this also is a lesson in leadership. So one of the things I've, I've always said is to be a great leader, you have to be first a great follower. And this is a different way of saying what you're saying. For me to lead my students, 
I have to understand what is it that they where where is it they want to go, what is it that they need. To, I need to understand them. I need to follow them. And I think this is what you're saying, and that's exactly what we have done on this campus, where we have brought everybody into the conversation. To me, a mentor is somebody I learn from. It's got nothing to do with age. My son can be my mentor, and my grandfather can be my mentor, right? and, and the whole spectrum in between. <laughs> right. So, John, uh, you have spent an enormous amount of time over the years running a global business, and now you are still connected globally with government leaders and others around the world. Um, and, and as we think about these crises, and we certainly saw this unfolding with COVID and the, you could argue, the not perfect uh, government response we've had in this country at all levels to the issue, uh, what, what advice or guidance would you offer business leaders on this call for how we, uh, in, on the business side, can better work with government leaders who are obviously driven by potentially different objectives and agendas? I think regardless of your political form of government or your political party that you're in, uh, the rules of interfacing to government leaders effectively starts with what your currency is. Your currency as a business leader and interfacing is your track record, the relationships you built and the trust. And as Stan said earlier, the first time you put that to stress can't be in the time of crisis. You have to build it ahead of time. Where you do that well, you can navigate through the tough issues very well. Where you do it poorly, you do not. Uh, I'm a believer that every company and every country will become a digital company. But if you watched how the large high-tech companies handled the crisis, and I'll draw two parallels, in the 1990s, 2000, it was the internet era, and there was a Snowden crisis. There was the issue about the internet being controlled by certain groups or the ability to take it over, et cetera. And yet we in the industry came together and worked with the regulators and the government leaders around the world, build a trusting relationship, and we navigated through it pretty crisply. Uh, the reverse has been true this time. Uh, large high-tech companies are in, in a fair amount of trouble, and I don't want to paint them all in the same category. Clearly, they're, they're not. But both the Democrats and Republicans, as well as Macron and Merkel in Europe and, and people in Asia, were saying that it isn't a question of too much power, it's how you use it. And there are very legitimate needs of the citizens and of the government leaders that the companies just stiff-armed. And so I think the key takeaway on that is companies of the future have to be both capital driven in the old sense of the world, economic return for their shareholders and their employees, but they've got to be equally balanced in terms of the benefits for society. <laughs> if they don't do that, regulation is coming. And by the way, antitrust will come. So uh, I think it is moving very rapidly. And surprisingly, I think a couple of the large tech players have been way too slow in understanding the potential implications for them and the industry. Uh, good, good point. So, Stanley, just uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about personal leadership style. You you graduated from West Point. Uh, you went and became a platoon leader in the 82nd Airborne. I would imagine you were all geared up with a certain leadership style to be an effective platoon leader in a command and control environment, making sure that people's lives were on the line, got all that stuff. Fast forward toward the end of your career, you're in this four-star general role, nuances, political figures, heads of state, all kinds of issues. Oh, by the way, the press uh, and everything else going on. How would you see your journey in terms of your leadership style changing over that 20, 25 years of your service? Yeah, it's interesting, Ron. Probably backwards. Like a lot of people, I first wanted to establish my credibility and my expertise. And so even when I didn't know what I was doing, I was telling people what to do because I thought that was my role. And that lasted up until the time I was about a company commander, 150 people. And you can micromanage 150 people. And I was probably an artist level micromanager. Uh, then later in my career, interestingly enough, I realized that it was much better if I shut up and I let my NCOs and my corporals and really competent people do it. And so my arc has been to be more and more decentralized, to listen more and talk less sort of with every year. So the older I got, the more I knew, the less I said. But also in a big organization, particularly a military one, but I imagine it's the same with John or Pradeep, 
you're not the expert on very many things. You got a ton of experts, all of them who are more familiar with it than you. What you become an expert on is listening, supporting people, sort of sniffing out when something doesn't seem right. And so my style evolved a lot and it got much more comfortable as I, uh, as I aged. Yeah, interesting. Either the other two of you have any similar thoughts about how your styles changed over the period of time that uh, from the time you started to kind of where you are now? Actually, I'm completely with uh, staying on this, you know, being a faculty member and a scholar, I used to think I knew everything. And then I realized I knew everything kind of in my domain, which was not the whole world. And the more senior I become, the more the chancellorial I become, the more I realize I basically know not much. And my people know a lot. And my job then is to synthesize whatever they know into some wise decision making. So another day, enable, empower everybody, control nobody. And that's the way I look at it, look at life now nowadays. I naively thought that uh, uh, people, if they were going to follow you, especially during a time of crisis, wanted to think of you as superhuman and you didn't make mistakes and follow me wherever to go. And it took me several getting knocked on my backside to realize uh, it's okay to say I don't know in an area and to identify people who can help you with advice. But you, when, once you make the decision, there has to be no discussion and there never has been in my leadership about are we going to move as one team. Uh, in terms of getting people around you you trust, uh, I think it's so important to do regardless of gender or age groups. And you've got to have mentors. Many people don't realize how important that is to your future for success. I think it's important and for a lot of leaders listening to this broadcast, you take time to help others who aren't as fortunate, people that perhaps don't come the same background or the same gender that you are or same religion that you are as you move forward. Uh, the last comment, however, is what I have become completely a believer in is replicable playbooks. So I'm a huge believer in getting a process down, whether it's how you do 180 acquisitions, how you digitize a country, how you move in and dominate a new market, and then how do you run that playbook with tremendous speed. And I've become a real believer in both how do you do it, much like a professional sports book team, but make sure everybody understands what pattern they're supposed to run when you call the play. Uh, that's probably the thing that I understand now more than ever. And almost every crisis has a very common set of characteristics, how you deal with it. Almost every move you make as a business or military or academics have a common set of circumstances in it. Getting that down, speaking the same language, and then having the courage to move rapidly with it separates usually those who break away and those that get left behind. Very, very good. So maybe uh, switching gears again here, you know, following almost every major crisis that uh, mankind has faced, no matter how grim it looked, whether it was the Black Plague, whether it was World War II, whether it was the Spanish flu, you, you name it, and you can name a hundred of these things. What followed often was a period of remarkable change, innovation, and growth, and, 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 and things happened in a new direction. Let, let me kind of uh, pick your collective brains here, uh, some thoughts on what you see might be coming out next, uh, say for this decade, that follows COVID, assuming we actually do get through the thing. Maybe, maybe start with you, Stan. Yeah, I, it's interesting. I think we have forced innovation during the COVID crisis. Look how the, the leap ahead in producing vaccines, and then look at the leap ahead in utilizing technology. What I found in the force that I had is I couldn't buy technology, figure out how to do it, and give it to the force to use and be very effective. I found we had to give them technology and they would figure out how it best fit. So I, I'm hopeful that what we are going to see is some of the technology that has emerged recently, the, the communications, it's not new, but it's new in its, uh, its utility to so many people now. So I think what we're going to see is new ways to do what we're doing now. Jamie talked about next year's conference will probably be a hybrid. It's that kind of innovation, I think, that's going to pick the, both, the best parts of both that I think they're going to push us ahead. John, your thoughts? I think we're in a period uh, that will be the starting point for speed of innovation we've never seen before. 
uh, what Stan's comments about COVID developing a vaccine in less than a year that normally takes 10 years plus. Uh, when you look at the startups, the speed of every one of the startups that I'm involved with sped up innovation, not slowed it down, and productivity went up. And I personally think that is permanent, although we're going to have to deal with some of the issues of not having the physical uh, contact as much. And unlike the prior economic downturns, uh, 2001, where 50% of the high-tech uh, venture capital back startups went out of business, or 2008, where 30% did, less than 10% this did, time did. And I think it showed what governments around the world did so much better in this economic downturn than anyone I've seen before is their fiscal policy and their central bank policies, i.e. legislation and regulation as well, came together. So I think you're going to see economic growth that we've not seen in decades following a downturn, probably in the 6 to 7% range the second half of this calendar year. And then the key is, can we work together to continue to accelerate this? Last call. I think he froze, Ron. I think, um, yeah, I think he froze. Uh, OK. Uh, uh, John, uh, your last comment got, uh, it was frozen on the screen. And you got said it. comment. Yep. Yeah, no problem. Probably a Huawei network somewhere here. Uh, it caused a little bit of problem. <laughs> uh, uh, the last comment is I think you're going to see the growth in jobs come from small to medium business entirely. Large companies will have such huge productivity gains, AI, they in total will not add headcount. If we don't think through the implications of this, if we keep doing the things like we did in prior economic turndowns, we're going to have a problem. So every regulation that we pass, every way we think about education, we ought to think about what is the impact on small business startups and job creation in that area. And how do we bring that uniformly across all 50 states in the U.S., across Europe and Asia Pacific? Good, good talk. So you're running one of the great research universities of the world. You got a lot of smart people thinking about the future. What what are your thoughts here? So, you know, my thought is that going forward, everything is going to be hybrid. It's not going to be this or that. Uh, births, birthdays, funerals, family gatherings, education, uh, professional meetings, everything is going to be hybrid. We're going to get used to dealing with person physically and dealing with person intermediated by technology. And I think that's going to be a great development, and that goes to support uh, new forms of technology are going to come into play. Uh, not just virtualization like uh, ex exists right now, but virtual reality, putting real figures in a virtual reality situation. So I think what John's talking about is going to be really exponential uh, increase in uh, the technology. My biggest concern in all of this is we are going to see a world in which the disparity is going to get worse and worse to the extent where I'm concerned that even a stable country like this could lead to some difficulty when the disparity becomes so extreme. Now, in countries like India and China, where the disparity is always already large, people are used to it. Here, we have not been used to this disparity, at least the generation that's living right now. And if that becomes too much, it's going to create real problems. So my concern is, can we do something with technology that allows us to intermediate and reduce this disparity? I don't know the answer. You know, it's interesting, just to tag on to that, the technology itself is creating this enormous opportunity for the human race to move forward. Not everybody is able to move forward. The technology itself is also creating the communications awareness of those who are not moving forward different than say in the middle ages where all they saw were people in their own village who were poor, sick, that they're not getting the opportunity. So in some sense, the technology is putting a little gasoline on the fire, uh, which creates an accelerant here. Uh -huh. and that would be, yeah. So uh, look, uh, I'd like to make sure that we have an opportunity for those in our audience. And I'm told that there might be a few thousand of you uh, to uh, uh, ask any questions you wish. And I think the mechanism, and uh, help me, Kelly, here, if, uh, if you would just uh, use the chat function and, uh, uh, and provide the message in that, uh, that way. If, if, if there's a better way to do it, uh, uh, let us know. Uh, I got one question from John Novak. Uh, Ron, would you share a major crisis and how you dealt with it? 
I like to tell you, John, I never had a crisis. Everything was smooth sailing in my life. And, uh, you know, I just like being on TV. Uh, look, I, I've had uh, a number, a number of uh, challenges everybody's had. One that was particularly gut-wrenching for me was I was, uh, <laughs> I was in New York City at, uh, I think it was a, a, a play, a musical, The Sound of Music. And in the intermission, I get a call from the guy who runs a major sector of the company of Northrop. And he said, uh, boss, I got to give you a heads up. And whenever someone says to you, boss, I got to give you a heads up, you know it's not going to be good. And he said, we just had a plane shot down in Colombia with five of our employees on it uh, doing this little mission that we can't really talk about. Uh, two of them were executed summarily when they were captured by the FARC. The other three are now being held and we don't know what to do. And my first question was, I didn't realize that we were running actual operations, including counter narcotics in this particular case operations. And there was a long pause and my executive said to me, boss, neither did I, but apparently we have that act going on inside the company. And I said, oh my God. And uh, it, it, was, uh, it was it sort of ruined the rest of the play as you can imagine uh, as everything else. And we had to go all hands on deck to try and figure out what on earth do we do to get these people back? Uh, unfortunately, we were dealing with the FARC. They were particularly nasty folks. Uh, in addition to our several folks, there was a, a French national who was, a cap, who was also captive. Um, we we're also told if you try and rescue them, they'll kill them. All those kind of things that you can imagine these kind of folks would do. Uh, I actually met with, uh, with uh, uh, Sarkozy and others to see what we could do. Uh, a number of people approached me and the company that said we can provide certain commercial means of, of uh, to be able to facilitate their, what that means is we would basically play blackmail or bribes uh, to get these people out, which is against the law of the United States. Uh, and despite our enormous frustration working with the State Department because nothing was happening, we had to make the call on that. At the end of the day, uh, I made the call that we would, we would not resort to that. It was very, very painful. Uh, and it did take several years. We finally got those three folks out. Uh, we gave them a hero's welcome when they came back to the, remember taking over a big hangar of our facility. Um, and, and unfortunately, uh, they, they gave up that many years of their life. We certainly took good care of their families. Uh, we made sure they were fully compensated. They had the pensions and everything as if they were in service. Uh, but it's one of those things as a leader that kind of gut wrenches you. I know you, uh, the other panelists here have had that. I'm sure Stan has had 10 of those, every one of those I've had given his, the nature of his, uh, his, his uh, profession. Uh, but that's an example of something where you have to go between what your heart wants you to do, what your head tells you to do, what the law says to do, and then ultimately what do you decide is the right thing to do. So, good. We have a couple of questions that are now coming in. They're streaming in, according to Catherine. Uh, here's a question. Uh, do you think AI, artificial intelligence, will take some jobs in the next five, 10, 15 years? And if so, which areas and how should the workforce prepare for that? Um, I'll just throw that open to the gang here. Who would like to take that one? I can take it. I think the short answer is yes, many jobs will be taken over by AI. And the best way to think about this is any job that can be written into a method or a program or a process that can be codified is clearly right to be taken over by AI. Number one on the list in my mind is truck drivers doing long haul uh, driving on it, like trucks. Uh, that is such an algorithmic uh, strategy. Tesla has already shown some uh, great and other car, other car companies too. I, I think that's ready to be taken over. I think AI, Ron, will have the most impact on society, not just from a job destruction and productivity point of view, but from the benefits as uh, well since the internet. Uh, I think it will be one of the few technologies that will actually, looking back, not only not be overhyped, but underhyped in terms of simplifications. I think that combined with digitization, the connectivity of internet of everything will change every aspect of our business. 
And we have to think about how do we create an incremental new jobs uh, to displace the ones that are being destroyed. On the positive side, every company will become a digital company in AI. It will move across segments of every business or government or defense with tremendous speed. And so you've got to say, how do you harness that power? And in a fun way, uh, Pradeep, I'm going to put part of this back on the universities. Uh, the universities have to think about how do you prepare students mm -hmm. for the jobs of the future, not not the past, because the jobs of the past, probably most of them uh, will not be in the same format as before. Same thing with high schools. Completely agree. Ron, let me jump on that because I think they both really nailed it. If you think of things in warfare, AI is going to speed up some processes, which means you're going to have to use AI to respond to an AI-driven attack, for example. But it doesn't mean that senior leaders can click it over to AI and then step back and watch the machines work. Senior leaders are going to have to know more than ever. They're going to have to understand the processes. They're going to have to get nuances that heretofore we really haven't had to so that we can coexist with this, use them without giving up our ability to, for freedom of action. And that's going to be tough. And, you know, just to show how much progress we have made, Stan, like when I was at DARPA, 94, 95, 96, I was managing programs in uh, drone, uh, you know, building drones. The biggest question was, Will a drone carry firepower and will it ever be able allowed to fire? Right? And lo and behold, 25 years later, it's a moot question. Yeah. Exactly. For all for all players in all conflicts. By the way, just uh, in, in your comments about uh, the future, I'm reminded of uh, a, a comment that the Jay Athi Murthy, my, my my colleague at UCLA College of Engineering or School of Engineering, made that the class that's being prepared now in the engineering school has to figure out how to be prepared to deal with the next 40 years through 2060. Mm -hmm. And if you think that anybody can figure out what on earth the world is gonna look like technologically in 2060 or 2050 or 2040, for that matter, maybe even 2030, uh, you know, good, good luck. Um, we have a, uh, another question, uh, which is a, a personal question for each of you. Earlier in your careers, did each of you ever imagine yourselves as leaders of such a large organization? And did you really intend to follow this path? So we start with John. No, I did not. I would have been very happy leading a small business in West Virginia. Uh, and uh, while I always played the chess game out before I made my next step, my parents taught me education prepares you for the future. And uh, uh, I intended uh, running a small business in West Virginia. And uh, like many things you do in life, if you Keep an open mind and think like a teenager, regardless of your age. It's amazing what can happen to you following that. Stan, the pl platoon leader, scaled up. <laughs> no, what in the army? You always thought about your next job. You didn't want to be a company commander until you're a platoon leader. You watched your company commander, and you go, "You know, I could do it better than him." And then you want to be that, and so it goes. But I don't think many people enter the army planning to be a general. Maybe a few. Because general's not that much fun. The fun is always back down when you're up much closer to troops. <laughs> you know, Ron, the greatest. You were a researcher and you suddenly became a serious executive. <laughs> I was going to say the greatest sin an academic can commit is think about being an administrator. I mean, it is so sinful, it's not even funny. So <laughs> clearly, I did not imagine being where I am. And uh, here I am, an accidental leader, an accidental chancellor, but nonetheless, and a series of accidents, which each one of which I've enjoyed, that have brought me here. It's Ron, funny. Me, you know, if I could, yeah. uh, it's the exact opposite, however, for successful companies of the future. And it's different than the leader having that view. But any company that really wants to lead in the decades in front of us will absolutely have an attitude toward building the best company in the industry and in the world. Yes. It's only the top two or three tech companies in each category that will lead. So you actually look as an investor for a different skill set 
with a leader that's about to lead them. And you want to see the ones that can truly differentiate themselves. Merely doing the right things three to 5% better as I was trained in business school, won't get it done. Uh, it's the <laughs> ones who think out of box incrementally, how do you change the world? How do you really uh, set ambitions that most people would consider impossible? With my startups, I don't invest in any of them unless they have a chance of being one or two in their product category. Yeah, interesting. You know, I just was just taken by what Pradeep said about, about his thing about being administrator. You know, to your colleagues who are professional in the uh, academic world, they see you as a suit. <laughs> Everybody else, they see you as a pointy haired professor who happens to be in the, in the corner office at the university. You can't win, right? <laughs> hey, I have a question here from uh, uh, one, one of our uh, listeners. Is it relates to China. Uh, would any of you care to make uh, some comments regarding the relationship between not just the United States, but really the West, as we think about it, and China? Uh, is it a rival? Is it a collaborator? Can we live without them? Can we not live without them? Do we have to live with them? Uh, Stan, why don't we start with you? Yeah, and I'm not going to try the business side because John and Pradeep have a better view, but I will say from a geopolitical and military side, which is enmeshed with their economic uh, aspirations. They are very, very aggressive and they are very ambitious. They have already created a level of capability that keeps us at bay. We can no longer pull the, the fleet off the coast and intimidate China or contain it. So it's a different game in terms of diplomacy and military than it has been. And so I think that means it's gonna be a different chessboard of the world as we sort of vie for economic position. And, and I think it's going to be a, compet a competition with sharp elbows. I would take it a step beyond that. Uh, I came out of Wang Laboratories, an American company run by Dr. Ann Wang, most brilliant man I met in my life. And uh, for the first 40 years of my business career, it was always a win-win relationship with China. Uh, tough negotiations. But uh, it was a very good win-win. And Zhang Zemin, the president that I often work with when I was in China, even when we did outsourcing and manufacturing of high tech, he was always thinking about how do we win and how do China win. The last decade has been a reversal. I think the Chinese leadership, not the Chinese people, have made a decision. They want to win, and they intend to do it at our loss. And when several of my military friends said that at first, I said, no, I don't think so. I think this is temporary. I think it's very, uh, very tough today. And I think this attitude we've got to have going into that. Uh, I think it would be naive to think that we're going to have our peers in Europe follow our lead this time. I think uh, they're saying we're going to do what's in their interest, and many of them are building very tight relationships with China. So I think this is one that for the next decade is going to be sharp elbows is the right word. Uh, I believe long term, we ought to find a way to work together. And that's in the best economic as well as best interest based society. But in the short term, until there's truly a, a reasonable level playing field, you can't have one set of rules for companies in China and jobs in China and a different one in the US. You've got to protect intellectual property. And you've got to say, how do we win together? Not how do I win and the other side lose? Well said, John. So I have a slightly different perspective. I think uh, the wave of prosperity, as, a, as I look at it, is not a standing wave. It's a traveling wave. The U.S. would want it to be a standing wave, and it'd be at the pinnacle all the time. It's, that's not the way it works. China right now, the wave has gone to China. It's going to go to the rest of, rest of Asia, Indonesia, India. I can just go down the list of these countries. And I think what we're going to see is for the U.S. to get used to other people being wealthy and well-to-do, countries being uh, uh, militarily strong and well-to-do, and live in a community of strong, wealthy countries rather than just being the dominant dog and everybody follows. A different way of, I think, what John said. <laughs> yeah. Well, great. Look, uh, we are uh, fortunately, unfortunately, reaching the end of our time, uh, but I want to put each of you on the spot uh, for a final lightning round, and, and in view of our time left, ask you to uh, restrict your answer to one sentence, if possible. And, and the question is, what gives you the most hope as you're looking to the future? And I'll start. The next generation of students that we are educating, they look at them, 
they give me the most hope. That's the country. That's that's great. Who's Ron, I share I share that what I see in the young people I teach at Yale um, is the values. It's not the skills yet, but it's the values, and and I am really impressed with what they want to do. Mine is technology. I, I think technology is going to able enable us to do things we used to have to wait decades to do, and we'll do it in two to three years, cure cancer. Uh, I think you can have strong economies around every nation in the world. And I think technology harnessed properly with the right education systems across the country and around the world will allow us to have uh, a dramatically increasing standard of living. So I'm an optimist for the future and an inclusive optimist for all people around the world in terms of what's possible. But at the foundation is gonna be technology and speed of innovation. That's great. Well, gentlemen, John, Stan, Pradeep, uh, what an amazing hour that we've all spent together. I've learned so much from you. Uh, what, what, it's been a lot of fun. I hope our audience has gotten some benefit from it. And we want to thank Jamie Montgomery and the Montgomery Summit for, for enabling this to occur. So with that, uh, we wish everybody a great afternoon or evening, wherever you are. And thank you all. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Nice job, Brian. Thank you. Pradeep. Great job. It was an honor.